That's Bino. Bino, very friendly. Molly is too. Yes, I do know. I don't, you know. Oh, okay. I didn't see my bunch of people. Okay, we'll just uh, go ahead and get started. Um, before we uh, do this uh, refuge and generating bodhicitta, um, I wanted to just remind everybody that at the what, what we're picturing and are imagining in our mind is that uh, Buddha Shakyamuni is out there in front of us. It's sort of like on a throw a platform of light and a lotus of light, emanating light rays out to us and all sentient beings who are surrounding us. And what we are trying to do is uh, generate the um, wish that we'd be inspired by the Buddha and our, our gurus and teachers and all of the enlightened beings and bodhisattvas to follow the path to enlightenment. To follow the path of the bodhisattva. I follow. never do that. What are you doing? I would just do Try and put his drink on top of the prayer. Oh. <laughs> I, I never ever do the church lady thing, but I thought you, you, you got a church. Try and I'd be a church yeah, but you didn't get your hand slapped. Was this... Oh, so where was I? Um, yeah, that we'd be inspired to follow the path of Bod Bodhisattva all the way to enlightenment. And what we are doing is picturing us that we're surrounded by all sentient beings. So, that what I was thinking about today is that um, our planet right now, the world that we live in, it is our world. You know, there's an I and mine and a grasping to this. And the people who live in this world are our people. And the, um, the leaders in this world who are making the decisions are our leaders. And I think we should make this wish that they also be inspired to follow a pathway to peace. Because I feel like currently um, we are careening very quickly towards a much larger uh, war. <laughs> and uh, I think if we think in these terms, you know, that all, all these, especially the, especially the ones who see themselves in the positions of power, be inspired in whatever way inspires them, not like by the Buddha, but whatever kind of an, uh, enlightened presence would inspire them to um, not take the steps that will lead to a much larger concentration, concentration that involves the whole planet in the world. So I would just sort of like to think that us to think that way when we uh, say these refuge prayers today. So once in English and then um, twice chanting it. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by listening to teachings and the other paramitas, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Tangye chodang toki chognam la jang chu bardu dagmi ki apsu chi dagi jin so bhi pe sonam ki rola pen chi sangye drupa shu Sangye chodang so di chognam la jang chu bardu dagni kyap su chi dagi jin so gi pe so nam gi rola pen chir sangye drupa shu And again, as we go to the four measurable thoughts, again, imagine that uh, all of the sentient beings are surrounding us. And picture the, the people on this planet who are in positions of power and who also the ones who are um, involved in combat and war and harming and things like that. And think of them as, as we, we say these lines from four measurable thoughts. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. 
May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. May we be blessed by our gurus, deities, and all the bodhis, bod bodhisattvas and buddhas to have the power and the perseverance to accomplish this. And then um, go to the seven limb prayer. And for those of you who have, who have uh, uh, sort of read read the visualization or, or listened to it, they go with the seven limb prayer. You can, can visualize that as we go through these lines. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind and present clouds of every type of offering, actual and mentally transformed. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merits of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until samsara ends and turn the wheel of dharma for sentient beings. I dedicate the merit created by myself and others to the great enlightenment. And with the mandala offering, we imagine a um, universal system in which every thing, every aspect of it, all consciousness, all forms and appearances are functioning in a perfectly balanced and wholesome interdependent way. Sangye Chodong. Wait a minute, wrong one. <laughs> I'm going back to refuge. Always a good place. Always a good place to go back to. Okay. So the other player now. Sajipati Jokshinto Tramri Rabinji Nidegen Pagi Sangye Jindu Rokunam Dakshin Vachapachu. And we offer this as a beautiful mandala that goes into the heart of the Buddha and all the beings of the merit field. As we say, Idam Guru Rana Mandala Kam Niryataya. So I think I'll probably be doing that kind of um, opening for the foreseeable future. Because uh, as as um, things seem to uh, not be getting solved on a on a confrontational basis in the world, it, I think it would be important for us. But this is the Tibetan Buddhism Center for World Peace, <laughs> and world peace begins with each one of us, really. So, okay. Um, oh my God, that's good. Last week, Brian uh, uh, Herman. Um, brought up a question which is which is very logical and very um, <clears throat> very timely in terms of where we're going right now with uh, Narvajuna's text. And the question was was something like this because I thought a lot about that and thought we and we, there was a lot of discussion we had and I and I don't recall there being a a really clear answer that you know, arose out of out of that. So I thought a lot about this and I thought a lot about where Nargajuna is going with the text. So Brian's question was something like this. If all sentient beings have Buddha nature and the methods that lead to liberation from the suffering of cyclic existence and the joy of enlightenment were taught by the Buddha over 2000 years ago, why, and they're valid, those type teachings are valid, why is it that more people in the world are not drawn to Buddhist teachings and practices? And that's a really great question. And it's perfectly logical to ask that question. And uh, like I said, it triggered a lot of discussion among us in the group. So here are um, some thoughts that I put down based on my, you know, 
my study of, of, of Buddhism and uh, emptiness with the lamas, the, the great lamas that we've had, the teachers that we've had, wonderful teachers. All, I mean, all of these teachers have been such a blessing. And um, so the answer to this question actually lies in the profound and firmly established ego self-grasping ignorance that has continually been at play within the underlying factors that make up our uh, conscious experience since time immemorial, let's say. This, we can go away from beginningless because so that is a very difficult concept, but just time immemorial. You know, as far as we can remember, we've been a conscious being and we've had, there is this underlying ego self-grasping that's sort of working there within our consciousness. <clears throat> So the ego self-grasping ignorance is, for the most part, so far beneath the surface of our awareness that it is totally unaffected by um, superficial examination or study or treatment. It's, we don't even go there. We don't even think about that. Only, only when that ego self grasping surfaces in the form of extremely destructive attachments, such as um, a very uh, a harmful addiction that we might have, or that somebody we know has, uh, or extremely destructive anger, fear, and aversion, such as hatred, violence, the kind of violence we're seeing uh, happening in the world right now, uh, and depression. Those kinds of things that are very extreme, that's when we really are aware that there is there is a problem, that we have a problem with, with suffering. Um, and we take notice of it. But most of the time, most of the time, our ego self-grasping ignorance sort of hums along beneath the surface, um, and we're not, we're not actually uh, that aware of it. Um, and it, it's actually running the show in a way that seems really perfectly normal and appropriate to us because we are so used to this idea of I and me and the self-centeredness of who we are. So we, we think of ourselves as the center of, of everything, the center of the world as we experience it. And in, 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 and that is true to, to a point, but we're not actually thinking of the, the connection that, that we have. As we don't think of that, it takes it takes practice for us to think that way, or habituation for us to think that way. A parent, for sure, will think that way about their children. For the most part, not all parents do, but but you know, for the most part. Um. So, what the ego does, and we're we're all we're all familiar with this. Uh, the ego will constantly try to blame something or someone other than itself for the problems that it seems to encounter. So, um, I mean, we all know this. We'll say, oh, that you know, person in the car behind me or the person in the car in front of me, what a jerk. They're the ones causing the problem. That's the, the, we, we don't, we don't um, it's not natural for us to assume that we have a part in all of it. Sort of like when we're when I was talking about what's going on in the world. It's okay. Let them be dogs. The less human intervention. <laughs> yeah, they'll they'll work it Just out. Let them do their. The cats are definitely being cats. They are nowhere to be okay. found or seen. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it'll just let them just do it. Um. Well. Yeah. So we have a tendency to uh, uh blame something else, some other thing, or somebody else for the problems that we are experiencing. There's a, there's a tendency to do that. It's like, it's not my fault, I didn't do it. Like kids will do. Um, so most of us take our ego self-grasping for granted. We think that it's just the way we are by nature and we rarely question it. If we do question it at all, and many of us do, many of us have done that. Again, what we'll do is we'll look to something other than ourself for the answer. And typically what we will do is we'll, um, we'll attribute a first cause to who and what we are, that there must have been something that who knows when created us. Uh, and either it's, um, 
something like a, a process of evolution, or we might think it is a some kind of divine being, and it's some mysterious way that we have been put here and have evolved uh, to be who we are and the kind of being we are. And we say, well, you know, God made me that way, or evolution made me that way. This, this ego self grasping that I have is just my nature. Um, and it's still, we're not, um, we're not actually owning up to it and taking responsibility for it. And this is what we actually need to do according to the Buddhist teaching. Um, because this self-grasping, self-centered bias that we have is so firmly established in us, it is by far the most difficult thing for us to uh, let go of, abandon, transform. It is the main thing in Buddhism that we are working on. It is what uh, the teachings of emptiness are all geared towards, towards getting an understanding of what ego self-grasping is actually and what do we do about it, you know? That's, that's going to um, be beneficial. So the mode of being which the ego subscribes to, and this is without hesitation or examination, the ego just naturally, and we know this from our own experience, subscribes to um, a mode of being that is inherent, independent self-existence. And it starts with me, I. We think me, I exist independently. The ego feels that way. We feel and believe that the mode of existence of the self that the ego labels variously as I, me, or often people will say my soul, my soul. This is, we think that those things are, this is a, this is a straight out of Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhist teachings. We think those, the I, the me, or the soul is, is unitary. It's not made up of parts. It's just a solid me. I. We think that it is um, independent, that that I exists independently. Nothing else has to um, support it or uh, cause it to exist. It just is, and it exists independently. Uh, we think that the I or the me is a self-sufficient kind of entity, that whatever the I-ness is, exists in and of its own self. It's not depending on something to be I or me. Um, we think that it is, since it's self-sufficient, that it is substantially existent. It has its own substance and existence. The I, the me, the soul, many people will think, actually exists, and it exists sort of like forever, independently. Um, now, what's the last one? Oh, and that is permanent. That it, uh, my I, my me, or your I and your me, is a permanent thing. It is for a forever changeless me and I. This is not, we may not um, analytically or logically think this way, but this is the way we feel about it. Especially as we, if we're not exposed to any kind of teaching that will make us start to think in a different way, we'll just think this is the way, this is the way it is. Um, so, of course, all of that flies in the face of, of observable evidence that any functioning thing, whatever it may be, and however we may designate it, exists in dependence upon limitless causes, just like Kavita said last week. Limitless causes uh, arise to create or, or um, bring into existence or bring into a dependently arising existence everything. If we think about it, if we really think about it, you can go all the way out to the origins of the universe to find the, you know, what caused this cup to exist, you know. And if you think about the consciousness, you just keep having to keep go going back to beginningless moments of the con consciousness. What caused the consciousness? Consciousness does not, according to Buddhism, it is not arising from any kind of matter or a brain or any kind of thing that's physically in the body. The consciousness is a, a different mode of existence that has its own causes, which are previous moments of conscious awareness. 
Um, so uh, everything exists in dependence upon limitless causes and conditions and is in a never ending process of continual impermanence and change. And again, we, we know that just even from looking at material from matter, we can see, even though it seems, these things seem kind of permanent, we know from experience that over time, these will all disintegrate. Over time, this house will, if it's not taken care of, if we don't take care of our house and keep it up and maintain it, it's going to basically fall apart and it will disintegrate. Yeah. I just, in its disintegration and in the arising of the objects that we see, there's a way in which you're discussing this that we might feel that it's some kind of culmination, termination point. You know, it terminates as it's it constantly to... changing. Yes. 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 I just it needs to be all always thought of as not that those causes ended here, but that right. the thing that's appearing itself is uh, in the process of transformation becoming causes for other right. I mean it's an easy way for us to to think that way is just to look at nature. You know, there is a constant cycling process of um, growing, uh, coming coming into fruition, dropping the seeds for you know the next you know continuation of that of that thing. We see that all all over. Everything is connected in, on even just on the planet. The oxygen, the air, the atmosphere. It's all connected to everything else and works together to create this continuously um, impermanent, constantly changing, uh, renewing, you might even say, um, mode of existence. And that's a really good way to think about impermanence. It's a good way to think about who we are, you know, that when we, then the body is through, it doesn't mean we're through. It doesn't mean the, the continuation of the process of, of, the, of our uh, conscious being is over. But uh, none of this, none of this concerns the ego at all. The ego, uh, the ego's um, grasp is so strong and the ignorance is so ingrained. I mean, uh, according to Buddhism, it's, it's this beginningless, beginningless uh, grasping at, at, at inherent existence. It's so ingrained that the ego doesn't actually our ego doesn't actually realize the inconsistencies of that ego view. It's, it's as if we just overlook it all, especially if we're not training ourselves to think in another way. It's just all uh, like the uh, default mode is that we just follow, uh, we follow our ego, like, you know, following our nose. Um, <clears throat> instead, what the ego does is it automatically projects its view of inherent existence onto everything it becomes aware of, including Buddhism, including Buddhism. And this is something, this is why I wanted to address this, because this is why uh, Brian raised the question, and this is the answer to Brian's question, and then Nagarjuna completely supports that in the very next stanza. <clears throat> this is true for anyone who is new to Buddhist philosophy and practice. And really, how could it be otherwise? Because, you know, we're coming to Buddhist philosophy and practice, not understanding what the, um, what the teachings actually are. And so we bring our ego self-grasping to that. And that's actually why we come to Buddhism. So most of us come to Buddhism either because we're born into it, or we've been searching for answers that will ease and abate our frustration, confusion, and suffering. And Buddhism seems like a peaceful spiritual path that uses meditation practices to calm our body and mind and make us feel better. This is normally why people will come to Buddhism. At that level, our ego is perfectly willing to give it a try. Because what the ego wants to do is to feel good. Well, I'm going <clears> to <throat> give people a little more credit also, you know, to try to understand 
what's going on. What is real. right? I mean, it's because of it's our. A little, I think we're drawn like, to it. We'll be drawn to it because we're experiencing suffering or yeah, confusion or like something right. Something, and we want stuff. something that's going to make us feel right. But better. I think there's an intellectual aspect to it, like. You know, these other traditions haven't made sense to me, and I don't understand the nature of the world and like what is it about. Sure. Is I think project. Yes. Need yes. to be allowed for. Yeah. But what we're addressing here is why so few people stay with Buddhism. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um uh when we hear so ego self-grasping ignorance typically projects inherent existence onto the Lama or the Guru, that Lama or Guru inherently exists there and they are going to, in some cases, people even think they're going to be, they're going to say, you know, the Guru, I'm hanging onto the Guru. You know, it's without the Guru, I'm, I'm, I'm completely lost. So we, we sort of project an inherent existence onto the Guru, which the Guru would say, there is no inherent existence here. <clears throat> um, and we also will project uh, inherent existence onto the practices that we've been instructed to engage in so that we, we will think, well, if I just go through the processes of you sitting in a particular way, like they say, and chanting a particular mantra and having a certain kind of thought, the magic will happen and I'm going to change. And we all know from experience that isn't actually what occurs. It, it takes a it takes a lot of habituation, a lot of thinking on our part, a lot of deep analysis to get to those levels where transformation can actually begin to occur. So it's not it doesn't it's not an inherently existing thing. And, and I would say a, a recognition and a willingness to change, be different than you are. Oh, absolutely. A willingness to have your biases, your opinions, your views, blah blah. Your version like, of how things are. And what is our bias? Well, I mean, the yeah. ultimate bias is self centeredness. <clears throat> and we have to have a willingness to look at that, you know. Which and is this, where the people leave. Which is, <laughs> which is, the which is where the ego goes. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Okay. So let me continue. <clears throat> so um, when we hear the lamas say that we have Buddha nature, our ego assumes it means we already have the inherently existing nature of a Buddha within us that is pure and wise. We just don't recognize it. This is quite common. Um, this is very common, actually. I've, people have come, there have been new people who come and go, and they come into, say, the Buddhist, a Buddhist class such as this, and they will come right out and say, well, I have Buddha nature. I have a Buddha that already exists in me, so that everything is is okay. That's the way they feel. There are other people. There's a there was a very strong new, what they called a New Age movement back in the '90s and early 2000s. And, and uh, because of my upbringing uh, and the people who I knew and associated with, there I was quite familiar with the New Age type people, and they would always say something really interesting like, I have a higher self that is like a god or a goddess and is perfectly, they would use things like Kuan Yin or they would have different names that they would have for who, they're, who they actually were <clears throat> and that they had chosen to come into this experience because they had lessons that they wanted to learn. That's not what Buddhism says. We, Buddhism says we are compelled into this existence because of our grasping at a self that the self is so important, me and mine, and we can't let go of it. So this is kind of like we're fooling ourselves if we think we have some kind of wise, higher self out there who is just choosing, making a choice to experience this existence, which can have quite a bit of pain and suffering, and as if it's like, well, there's certain things I need to learn, so this is why I'm doing this. That's not, that is not the way Buddhism is talking about what ego self-grasping ignorance is. It's ego self-grasping ignorance is the way it's put. So, um, Buddha nature refers to the non-inherent, dependently arising nature of consciousness that has unlimited positive potential 
when all of its afflictive and cognitive obscurations had been removed and the empty nature of the self and phenomena is directly realized by the mind. So there's a process that occurs in, through the Buddhist practices where we begin to understand what is meant by Buddha nature, that it's not actually a Buddha already existing, but it's a process that we're going through where we begin to understand how everything is dependently arising and that we have a choice. We actually have a choice whether we want to suffer or we don't want to suffer. Obviously, we don't want to suffer. So the choice is to follow what the Buddha's directions are. And it basically starts out with what we've already done, the, the um, removing all of the, the negative uh, actions of body, speech, and mind, we, we stop doing that, and we start habituating ourselves to the positive actions of body, speech, and mind that the Buddha suggests. And as I said before, what this will do, it will remove uh, the disturbances that we have going on within our mind, so that we'll actually be able to understand what the, uh, the deeper levels of teaching that the, that the Buddha gave mean. If we're, if we're all caught up in... Um, uh, grasping and attachment and um, craving and hatred and anger and wanting to get back at somebody and being jealous, we're not going to have the space within our consciousness to even contemplate or think about what emptiness means. We will be too disturbed, which is why the Buddhists gave these as the first practices. But again, the ego doesn't look at things that way. Um, the ego is always looking for a quick fix that will allow it to feel good while continuing in its self-centered practice. So it's like we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to have our cyclic existence and be happy with it and continue with that you know, grasping and I want it and I need and I want and I want to constantly be getting what I need and what I want and be happy and have no problems with that. That's what the ego is looking for. It's sort of the ultimate justifier of your behavior and trying to figure out how to yeah, frame it as, right. you know, either we're, your karma or you're this or you're that. And, you know. Yeah. Kind of what we, what the, what the, the ego kind of grasping will do is we'll hop from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, trying to remain distracted and happy and, um, and not, you know, not having any problems or anger or um, things getting in the way. And it, it's, it's, it's not a method that actually works. It doesn't, you know. It, it, it just goes around the circle. And ultimately, uh, and ultimately you know, the, the um, afflictive emotions you know, win the day. Um, so the ego, since the ego is always looking for that quick fix and to feel good, and if the Buddhist teachings and practices don't provide the feel good factor that our ego is looking for, there is a tendency in many people to just drop Buddhism and move on to something else that does provide the feel good factor. And that could be anything. It could be you know what, I think what I really need instead of Buddhism is another relationship with somebody and move to a different state and, you know, start up with, you know, so-and-so, and, you know, and then I'll really be happy. That's what really, that's what really is going to work for me. Not this Buddhism. And that's, that's the ego talking. That's the ego talking. And it's quite common. I, and I, and it is, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm really not criticizing it because we've all done it. I've done it. I've done it. We're trying to not change. In my opinion, we don't want to change. Opinion, we're trying to not change and somehow pull Buddhism into proving that we are right. Exactly. <laughs> that sense. No, no, that I makes mean, a lot of sense. Or we're trying to change, but the change is very difficult to accomplish because right. of the ego. I'm saying from the ego's point right. of view. Right, from the ego's ego point of view, the we want. big role in life is to be right. <sighs> yeah, isn't it? The, oh. Is that not the truth? The ego has always wanted to be right. <laughs> wow. We all know this. I mean, we all are quite familiar with it. <clears throat> There's a, 
go ahead, Brian. Brian. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask a question. All right, go ahead. So, what's the relation between ego and consciousness? Well, but con the ego works through consciousness. It's a conscious experience. So, right? in Buddhism, when we talk about subtle consciousness going from lifetimes and lifetimes, is ego part of that subtle? Yeah, sure, sure. Because the e it, it is a type of consciousness that misperceives the way things actually exist. That's what. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you need to define the term ego before you can actually answer this question, because ego, saying. Freudian or Freud first used, you know, it, psychology has mm. a particular definition of ego. You might, you know, and then we use it colloquially. Okay, so, so, so I'm, I'm go saying, ahead. you know, one thing that would be good to ask Brian is what, when you use the word ego, to what are you referring? Me? Yeah. Yeah, that's your answer. <laughs> there you go. There's your answer. <laughs> well, you can't. You know. No, you know. I, mean, I think. To what are you referring? Well, I think the ego is the the just drive to see everything is independent and self centered and focused on I at the expense of everything else, and that drives every decision, every thought we have to our own desires, our own preservation, our own wishes uh and it seems to me that's what is so hard to break free of and so that's i guess what i mean by i think about ego so what would happen if you keep banging away at this path to that potential you know that complex of things you just mentioned i mean over time well i mean the ego would become less uh, if you're successful in, in the path i mean that's the that was mm. what you'd expect that's what would happen according to you because it's so strong it takes a long long time to do well, it's a lifetime etc cetera, etc cetera. so so um but i think the the if i understand what you're saying the the concept is that this ego that we talk about here is not the ego that we even consciously think about or like, I like that car, or I like that person, or I want this, or I want that. That's a conscious decision, but it is an unconscious, ever-present, ever-pervasive drive to fulfill, I don't know how to say this, to fulfill me, or to fulfill eyes, mm -hmm. wants, desires, mm -hmm. me, right. that we don't even recognize. Mm -hmm. It is a type of consciousness, but it's below... Are uh, uh, um, it's subconscious, you might say. Yeah, right. But that's why I asked about subtle consciousness right. versus gross right. consciousness. When we do notice it, like I said, is when it really rises to the surface in a very strong form of attachment or aversion, anger, you know, hatred. Oh. Then we, there it is, you know. Then that there is the monster. But um, most of the time, it's just sort of you know there. It's running the show. Which is why I say I like this, I want this, I need that. But we're not, we don't think of it as being necessarily some kind of capital. Yeah. But what I would say, according to uh Buddhist teachings, is that the ego is a mistaken consciousness. It is a consciousness, it's not a it's not anything other than a consciousness. It's a mistaken consciousness that misconceives and misperceives the way things actually are interdependently connected and exist. You know, it's interesting, just a couple of other comments. So I'm assuming, maybe my assumption is correct, that there were other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas before Buddha Shakyamuni. Yes, yes, yes. Because we're talking about beginning this time, right. time and memorial. Yeah. So if you say the egos exist at the time and memorial, well, so has this concept of Buddhism or this, this idea. So it's still, even though I've asked about since Buddha Shakyamuni has been around for 2,500 years, but it, they're both, they both go, go go way back and seem to be, um, you know, at odds with one another. But the irony or the thing that's puzzling is that, you know, even if you sit in your own identity and you say, I exist, 
You can say, I will not exist eventually. And this is, there's no way that you can prevent that. There's no way you can get around it. It is, it happens, right? And if you're in certain professions, you see it much more often on a regular basis and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. people die, people mm -hmm. disappear. And so everything is impermanent, including this existence is impermanent. But for some reason, the ego can't accept that, recognize it, deal with that, see that as actual reality. So even though the facts are there, even though it's clearly, and this is, you know, even though, you know, I'm thinking about uh, H.G. Wells, as you're talking in his time travel uh, book and, and, you know, the movie and how if you sit in the same place over centuries, you right. see all these different things change. Right. And, and that's what they're talking about. Nothing stays the same. So it, that is the reality. But it's interesting that our ego or people or whatever can't even see reality, even though that is the reality that really exists. Right. It's obvious when you actually analyze it, yeah. you know, look at it. But that's what the ego doesn't even recognize that. Because it's so, the grasping is so, so strong. And this, it's, it's a big thing that we, we are dealing with and, and have to work on it. Thankfully, that's actually what we're doing. Otherwise, we wouldn't all be sitting here. We'd be off hopping somewhere else going, I want to feel good. <laughs> so, um, would you, yeah. Would you maybe say, you know, using psychological terminology, that it's sort of like a neurotic complex that we have? Sure, sure, I would. And we sure carry it. This complex is like the main thing we carry. It is the strongest neurotic complex in existence. But this may be why, and again, this is my own perspective. This may be why, and I played this. You know, understanding. Well, if you can, if you believe in reincarnation, which is what Buddhism says mm -hmm. happens, that's one where we don't have a lot of evidence. Mm, for yeah. so you know that's a little more difficult to actually i think accept as a right because most of us don't happen. remember right. it at all exactly. yeah um but you know i think what people grasp at is their current existence because they they see when their current existence ends to their death that is it there is nothing after that they you know i mean maybe you're a good christian you go to heaven and whatever <laughs> all these wives and whatever virgins. I, I don't know, but, mm. you know, there are all these promises, but you still can't say those promises actually right. exist or, or occur. Uh, so it seems to me that if one would, uh, if one could embrace, believe that reincarnation or existence continues after this current life event um then maybe the ego wouldn't be so attached to the current existence and be so grasping at everything currently for its sustenance or its happiness or its fulfillment that perhaps could relieve it a bit but you know according also according to buddhism you know when when you die when i die that is the end of brian that's the end of christopher it would be the end of kevin and kavita when we go when we are then the consciousness has these basic kind of propensities the the imprints that we put on our on our mental continuum and we will be sort of thrown into according to buddhism another rebirth whatever that may be and it will no longer be christopher brian kevin kavita ajay it will just be whoever that is with the propensities that came along with it. I think that's that's why they say there's one universal existence. We are just a fraction of it. So what mm -hmm. you said is, you know, that they say it's it's we are just a fraction of it. And the mm -hmm. ego, I understand that it's it's a mental picture of the consciousness that we are. Yeah, which comes into mental image, which is formed by mind, which starts the delusional state, and then we get delusioned on it and call that state an egoic state. But we're actually a one conscious 
universal consciousness that we go back to and then have this cycle I can think so this isn't a fraction of uh, existence we're having as me, you, Kovita, but we're all the same. You know that it's a basic concept that yeah, a universal existence. We're just fractional because of this egoic state of view that I'm independent, I'm separate. I think we go. That's that's the hard part of grasping that. How do I know that I'm one universal existence? Yeah, one of the ways that's that's you're making a really. Uh, really good, good, good point there, Ajay. The one of the ways that Buddhism talks about it, and Hinduism as well, yes. uh, is that consciousness is like, if you were to think of like maybe like a net, it's a very three D, uh, multi level net where everything is interconnected. Now this net would be consciousness, right? Yeah. And the way that consciousness sort of experiences itself or other consciousnesses or you know the way this whole big net works is that at every little intersection which is there are multiple intersections right but uh every intersection there is a, a consciousness that can it's then they say it's almost like a mirror you know that re is reflecting what consciousness is what the ego does is grabs onto that little fraction that you're talking about, that little piece that little intersection and says this is mine this is my kingdom, if you want to put it that way. I own this. I will not let go of this because it is mine. Yeah. And so we become very attached to our little fraction of consciousness, the way and you that's put it. What, like Ovita yeah. said, it's a neurotical, let's say, because we have perceptions. Right. I see things, I hear things, I touch, I smell. So that builds my perceptions to form my mind. So I'm still a fragmentation of the whole conscious awareness, but on my own real, I mean, own small word yeah, through yes. my mind. That's why we call it, it's it's all delusional to, mm -hmm. it's all my mind form, they say. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably what it is. It is it's like I was saying before, it is a, it's a misconception that we all seem to have, or those of us who are find ourselves here, it's like with existence, uh, a misconception that um, everything is separated off when actually it is sort of all interconnected and depending on all of the pieces, you know, uh, that's that's the way Buddhism speaks about consciousness, right. not as if it's this one uh, unitary thing, but it is this system of interconnected, which which can form that that it enables what we would call relationship experiencing one another. And all Buddhism is about is basically how do we experience one another and everything in a way that is um, positive and beneficial and is going to generate happiness and not suffering. That's the big, that's the whole point of the Buddha. And all the religion, not only Buddhists, promotes the same core basic message that we're all one. I, I want to just uh, say quickly, Christopher's description of like a net and the intersections um, is a little bit different. I mean, depending on how you look at it, you could say we're all one. However, you, I, Dickie, Kevin, Christopher, and all of us, and every every consciousness has agency to manage its um, what it is apprehending and how it's conceiving. There is not some one consciousness that absorbs us and sort of is in control. So there's a paradox there because, and you know, we've asked from the beginning, we've always asked this question. And the monks, not being native English speakers, maybe even Dickie has a better answer to this, but they never would say, Yeah, we're all one. They don't say that. We each have our own autonomous, you know, on you know, you can almost say this literally agency mm -hmm. to decide. So the Buddha nature is pointing to this emptiness and dependent arising nature of this pinpoint 
of awareness that you know we call me, but it's a, it is a paradox, but you can never say they would never say in our tradition that we're all one. Yeah, it's an interesting the way that's it's like um... cells in a body, each cell, that cell in the body is dependent on the next cell and the next cell and the next cell, and it expands out to the organs and so forth. But that cell can never say. You can see the difference. I don't even know what words to use, but it's kind of is it more morally towards thinking of what consciousness is. Mm -hmm. So we keep hearing about one, I would again say, universal consciousness. So what is consciousness? You know that as, term as is the, never used in yeah. Buddhism. We never talk about universal. No, it doesn't talk about universal one consciousness. That is not a term that would ever show up because of this issue. Because as a Buddhist practitioner. The thing that's encouraged at the level of awareness we're at, and maybe this is really at the level of awareness we're at, we have to take responsibility. So it is counterproductive to think we're all one consciousness, because then you might have a tendency to throw, well, then I have no job to do. You have to take responsibility, own the agency you have for the direction of your thinking and behavior. So it's it's an important distinction yeah um, if we and were we can, and we are mistaken if we try to make every every traditional and every uh set of jargon that each tradition uses to fit everything because it is not like that yeah buddhism does differ uh that's in, what, yeah, in that's what Buddha was view saying. buddhism has never said we are all one consciousness because what that would mean if we really were all one consciousness is that we would have no choice in the matter of, at all. It would be almost as if there would, what would be the purpose of, of all of us separate beings? We, we would have no, uh, there would be no sense of relationship with anything, which all, all of us will agree that good relationship gives us great joy. It is how we actually experience love, express love, receive love. We all know this. So relationship is part of what consciousness is about. If consciousness was just one, then it would be like this monolith that was even beyond what a dictator is, because it would be nothing nothing to dictate to. So the basically, Buddhism says the nature of consciousness is in this sort of relationship form, where everything is interconnected and interdependent, and we do um, we do have a choice about whether we're going to generate suffering or whether we're going to generate benefit. The way uh, Venerable Rabina always says is that you're the boss. You're the boss. The Buddha is not the boss. Nobody else is the boss. God is not the boss. You're the boss. We are the ones who have to make the conscious decisions to go in a direction that is generating positive momentum and good relationship, beneficial relationship, um, wholesome, loving relationship. And so with, with, if going back to the idea of consciousness was all one and what that actually means, if you take it to its extreme, it means there is no relationship. Yeah. So this, this may be an ignorance of terms, but if as Kavita was talking about agency, and as Ajay was talking about the, his consciousness and perceiving of the world, and then you were just talking about relationship, what came to me, came to mind is, so there is a consciousness that over which I have agency or control mm -hmm. or something like that, yeah. which is distinct from the consciousness that you have agency mm -hmm. over and that Kavita has agency over. So there is something distinct. And in order to have a relationship, whether it's in, in Buddhism, that relationship is by its nature interdependent, there needs to be two entities at a minimum to have a relationship. Right. So that there, which further complicates then the idea or understanding, at least in, in my consciousness of then how is there not an I if 
there's an agency that I have I have a consciousness of, over which I have agency, and I my consciousness is in relationship with your consciousness. There's yeah. two distinct consciousness right. here. So how is there not something right you? Unique. For there is. Better. There is an I. Buddhism says there is an I. Okay. It's not the I that the ego thinks. The I that the ego thinks exists is, as I said before, it's an independent, not an interdependent I. It is a self-sufficient I. It is a permanent, permanently existing I. It doesn't. The the I ness, the me ness, according to the ego, doesn't change. I will always be me. Who, the, who I am. Um, it doesn't leave room. The ego's, the ego's grasping view at trying to take their little fraction of consciousness and say, this is my personal kingdom. You know, a way of putting it that way. Uh, it, it's shutting the ego. What the ego consciousness is doing is basically shutting itself off from an interdependent kind of relationship where there can be a give and a take and a change and a transformation. And um, and as we see with interdependence, as we see continually over and over in the world, interdependence can go in a very uh, negative, psychotic direction that is not beneficial. And Buddhism knows this, but I mean, Buddha, Buddha acknowledged it's right from the beginning. Suffering exists and it's we don't like it. And so here's what we can do to fix the situation. You know, we need to see how we actually are connected, how we actually have a kind of an impermanent changing nature, but there is relationship going on. It is like you have a distinct, you might say, mental continuum, as I have a distinct mental continuum, but that doesn't mean the two of those or the three of those or the four or the five of those, we can't actually sort of come together and exchange, you know, sort of weave in and out and, and um, work together. And it also doesn't mean we can't, you know, destroy them. That we, it means we can destroy them. I think it's maybe a little bit of terminology because I think the, you know, when they talk about um, independent of Buddhism, it's non-changing. It is just completely self-sufficient. And, and in reality, that's not any, anything is or any one of us, you know, any plant is or anything else. Is. So, I mean, we all depend on other things in order to, you've got to eat food in order to survive, you know, you've got to, have interactions or to be happy. I mean, so you know, if you think about it, it's, it's a little bit definitional. And, and the definition of true independence in a Buddhist standpoint is really I am solely self sufficient. I need nothing else. I need no input. I need no any. And that just is not reality. Right. That's not real existence. Right. And the, and, the, and the situation we've got going on with what they call ego self grasping ignorance is that they're, they, the ego is sort of ignorant or it's or overlooking or just not even recognizing that reality. It's just saying, I'm right. <laughs> I'm the center of everything and I want my way. It's kind of, I mean, when you when you get really down, I mean, you look at the look at the you know situation that happens in war. I mean, it's awful, it's horrific what's going on, but it's all due to ego self-grasping ignorance saying. I and mine, what I want is what I want, and you're getting in the way of it, so I'm just going to destroy you. And it's a total disregard for the interdependent nature of everything. And it only leads, as the Buddha said, to suffering. Uh, it doesn't, uh, the ending will not be good of that, which is why I, I want us to think about the world as we're saying our prayers and doing our practice. The also doesn't recognize it's not suffering. It blames its suffering right. on something yeah, else. It doesn't recognize its own suffering. Mm -hmm. It does. It, it, it doesn't feel good. And when it doesn't feel good, when it, it recognizes it when it gets to an extreme level, such as somebody who is severely, deeply depressed recognizes their suffering. They recognize it. They may want to blame it on their parents or blame it on their boss or blame it on something, but it's they recognize it and they are experiencing it. Hey, incidentally, people on Zoom, we don't have anyone monitoring the chat. So if you have a, something to say, you're going to have oh, to unmute yourself. Just and say speak it. out. <laughs> yeah, so 
Did you have more on that thought? Well, I was just going to say that even in that definition, the ego still doesn't recognize. Right. So the it doesn't recognize, recognize it's caught it's it's the genesis of suffering. Yes, right. I think so. It recognizes the suffering, but it doesn't recognize it's the genesis. Yeah. Right. right. It doesn't recognize that perhaps it has a part in it. Until it's kind and of that brings you to the four noble truths. And 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 out. really, as I, as, I, as I think I've said before, what brings most of us to Buddhism, other than if we were born in it and we were already mm, had the propensity, maybe from another life, to just be drawn to that thing, what will bring most people to to Buddhism is they've tried other things and it doesn't seem to be working. Doesn't seem to be fixing the problem, no matter how many religions or trips they take or other religions they may have tried. So they go, all right, maybe I'll give this a shot and see if this will help relieve my uh, frustration, my lack of uh, not feeling right, not feeling good. You could put that all under the category of suffering. They're just small little ways that we suffer, which can grow into huge ways of suffering. So back to this, your 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 question that you brought up, why are not they're not more... Uh, Buddhists in the world, if this is such a, a noble path and logical one. Um, so, this is why. So, people, few people engage in Buddhist practices seriously or consistently. Here we go. The Buddhist view of wisdom realizing emptiness is the antithesis of ego self-grasping. It is its exact opposite. And we are attached to our ego self-grasping. So when at some, even, at, even if it's at a subconscious level and we hear some of the teachings about selflessness or emptiness, we, the, the ego will go, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that or feel good about that or like that. That's at a very, that's at a very um, surface level, right? At a, at a deeper, deeper level to the ego, which we cherish in our own, you know what the ego's like? You know that the movie, uh, The Lord of the Rings and Gollum has that ring. And, he, and, he's, and he's, he's calling it, my precious. That's the ego. That, that, what that represents in that story is the ego. And Gollum knows that if he throws that ego into the fire, if this is the end of the movie, if you've all seen it, if he throws that ego, uh, that, um, ego into the fire, the ring into the fire, his precious, that's going to destroy it. His precious will be gone, but there will be, um, peace will will reign again in, you know, whatever that place was. But Gollum can't let go of it. And so he goes down into the fire with it, still grabbing onto my precious. And that's what the ego is. At its, when you get to its core, it is incredibly, we are incredibly attached to it. So, so somebody who comes to Buddhism and hears the term selflessness, they may on a uh, superficial level go, oh, this isn't for me. I don't like it. I think I'm, you know, I'm going to go find something else. But on a deeper level, it threatens. It is a threat to the ego. It is a threat to the ego. Um, the ego, the ego actually is, a cyclic existence has arisen because of ego self-grasping. Ego self-grasping Ignorance is the root of cyclic existence, where this clearly we can see the suffering going on in this just on this planet. This is part of what we call the cyclic existence. Sorry. So yeah, go ahead. Is ego uh, uh, ego then has to be a dependent arising as well? Yes. But it seems like it's an ever present, persistent. That's because our consciousness is ever present and persistent. Our consciousness, according to Buddhism, is always going. If the consciousness is focused on my precious and can't let go of it, then the consciousness is going to experience the results of that, which are 
incredibly neurotic and don't and don't end well ever, you know. So basically, what you could say is cyclic existence to the ego. You could say cyclic existence is the ego's baby. It's the ego's my precious. And what Buddhism is saying that we can be liberated from the the suffering of cyclic existence. And the way the ego hears it is. You're saying, I'm not going to have a self anymore. And then this whole thing that I kind of really am attached to is I'm going to be free of it. I don't like it. It sounds like it's going to end. It sounds like my little kingdom is going to, I'm going to have to let go of it. And that's why at a very deep level, uh, so few people will be attracted to what Buddhism is offering because it doesn't support this heart kind of feel good ego you know, I'm, I'll be happy as long as everything's going the way I like. And um, so fundamentally, it's, it works too hard. It's yes, it's going to require loosening the grip. It's harder than being a Catholic or a Jew. It, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, because a Catholic or Jew, are, there's a promise there. There's a promise that you will be taken care of. Buddhism doesn't promise that you're going to be taken care of, it doesn't say. You know, somebody's either going to take care of you because you were good or they're going to throw you into hell because you were bad. Buddhism says there are good places you can be and there are bad places that you can be, but you're the only one who's sending yourself there. It's not, it's nobody else is doing, doing the dirty deed. You're the one doing it. And ego doesn't like to hear that. Ego wants to go, give me some higher self that's going to take care of it all, you know? So I can learn more lessons. So I can learn the, so the lessons that I came here to learn. Um, it's the ego is quite deluded, uh, but at its at its core, remember it's that it's that golem, my precious. It's yeah. grabbing onto it. Uh, the, there's a you know, the Lord of the Rings is a really if, if you always when you watch the if you happen to watch it again, always think of the ring as representing you know, this ego self-cherishing thing. Um, and then it takes on a completely different deal. Um, but one of the scenes that I think is so important for us is when Bilbo Baggins, I don't know if you have seen this, but there's a point at which um, the tall Gandalf, Gandalf. Um, who represents Wisdom. a liberated being. So Gandalf and Bilbo Baggins have a relationship from the beginning of the story. And Bilbo Baggins knows he wants to get rid of the ring. And so he's going to give it to Gandalf because Gandalf, being an ascended master, he knows how to deal with can it. Can deal with it. Yeah. So that's there's some other elements there. But in the moment, they show this in the movie. I haven't read this particular thing in the book, so I don't know. But in the movie, they show Gandalf taking the ring from Bilbo Baggins. And you see a flash. And this is what Buddhist practice is trying to get, where Bilbo Baggins turns into this awful, horrible, ugly monster, golem-like creature, because he doesn't want to give up the ring. Bilbo Baggins, apparently, in his path this far enough along to recognize and see it and does right. ultimately in that exchange um hand it over yeah you know, and then you know gandalf does, you know gandalf being an ascended master he's holding the self-cherishing and he gives it to frodo <laughs> who he sees as even more you know gandalf Innocent. apparently recognizes some potentiality in himself where he can get rehooked so yeah. Frodo goes off to throw it back to where it came from. But right. um, the point I'm making is you could say that all of these practices, especially the practices around emptiness, are to lead you to, and there's methods and practices that we're going to be talking about and have talked about a little bit, but not that much, where you are led to a moment where you see the flash of this grasping because we normally because Christopher mentioned it doesn't see but there are specific methods in our lineage to get you to just have that moment 
like Bilbo back and sad. Yeah, right. Where right. he goes, oh, no, I can't give it up. Right. And that is what, then, once you become familiar enough with the inner golem, that inner, I can't give it up. All these practices are getting you to recognize that's in you. And you do them enough times that you accept it. And at that moment, then you can really begin to appreciate when they say, what is being refuted is the self grasping. That is what's being refuted. Mm -hmm. Not that you don't have, um, you know, the capacity to have, uh, let's just use loosely individuated conscious uh, river of mental moments and, you know, agency, like I said, but that what's being refuted that doesn't exist is the, the, that, ugh. Yeah, that anyway, but you know, independently self existent thing. We, we've talked about this book before, but because I do exercises, and we're probably going to, I assume, now we're going to cover some where they try to lead you oh, yeah. to an experience mm -hmm. of what this is that we're refuting. Right. Because normally it's just below the surface, it's like the ground we walk on, so we can't recognize it. And, Blah, blah, blah. But, but Brian, I thought I mentioned that thing in the ring is really cool where that moment where I know bag is free. Well, also, the, the, the thing that stood out to me is Gollum going down into the fire because yeah, he couldn't, yeah. couldn't let go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's that's why, Brian, Buddhism has relatively few consistent adherents. You know, people are interested, they come, they, they, they see the monks, the robes, they hear stories about of monks walking through walls or levitating, and they find the whole thing you know, enticing in some way. Uh, but when they actually, most of us, when we hear what Buddhism is refuting, and it's this that we're grasping onto so much, many of us are not ready to even go there yet. Oh, related to this too, I, I forgot to mention that if you think of it also, every the consciousnesses that are attracted to this world where you're asking in, in the context of this world and this planet that you know and love, why are there so few adherents to this path? Well, you're not coming into this world because you're wanting to surrender my precious. Mm. The whole reason you're- Unless here. you're enlightened, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, and then you, your question, another element is you have to assume that there are, beings that are liberated and are gone, but the self-grasping ones that are after Gollum, you know, the Gollums mm -hmm. are still here. And so the Gollums are what we're talking about. So when we look at the world of the society and wonder why there aren't more practitioners, because it would be like saying, why won't Gollum give up the ring? Mm -hmm. And so the ones that have given it up aren't here. So all that's here <laughs> in the realm that you and I are experiencing are the golems. Or the ones who are in the process. We're coming back to help everybody get out of here. I thought that's what we Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's but true. But they're not coming because they're they're they're, uh, they're drawn because of the self-grasping. They're coming right. back. A liberated being is coming back to, to help, to be a benefit, like the, our teachers, you know? So another, another question on, the, on that point. So in... Right, so psychologists will tell you that the pain of loss is twice as great as the pain of, of the joy of gain. So mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. are are generally inherently loss averse, right? So right, <clears throat> the loss of your ego is which is going to be felt by that by by that understanding. Sure, twice as bad as whatever you gain from losing. You were self grasping. Yeah. So I hear the, I, I've heard a lot of teachings about we need to lose our ego self grasping. And in common psychology terms, what does that get replaced with? Right. And the problem is we don't, we don't know because we haven't experienced it. But the, what the, um, all of the teachings will say is that the experience of joy and bliss that is, that occurs when you are a, a liberated being or an enlightened being is so much stronger and greater and wonderful than anything the ego could ever experience in terms of happiness and joy and bliss. It is completely untainted with um, the grasping and the deluded 
uh, way that the ego will project onto things that uh, will project onto things qualities that they don't have. Whereas a uh, somebody who is uh, enlightened would have a complete understanding of the way everything is, and the and the the bliss and the joy that is experienced by that kind of being is beyond what an ego could imagine. However, because the ego can't imagine it, the ego actually can find it frightening. So, in, to that point, in the teachings, what is experiencing this unbelievable joy and bliss? Consciousness. Consciousness. Yeah, consciousness. Consciousness, according to Buddhism, actually, consciousness um, always has some kind of form that goes with it. Be it, it could be extremely subtle, which is why, you know, when they're, they're tell, they tell them, talk about these visualizations that we do. And they always say, you know, picture it like they're, they're made out of the body. It's the form is made out of mm -hmm. rainbow-like light. So if you, like Kavita did this a couple of weeks ago, and, and it was a very interesting thing that occurred in her mind because she was watering something out in the garden. And she passed the, the hose through some light, and all of a sudden, there was a rainbow up here. What it, what it said to her is that, Wow, that energy, that that subtle form, is actually all always there. All all that's required is the right prism to see it through. You know, so the so there is a subtle body that um, that an enlightened being has. And in Buddhism, they all they even say our our consciousness. They'll say our seat the seat of our clear light, uh, the indestructible drop of our clear light continuum of consciousness is always, there is a subtle, a uh, very subtle form of energy that you could call form that always accompanies it. And so the form, form and, um, form and consciousness sort of go together, but they are not, they're two different, they're two different things, but they are all, they're connected. Wings of the bird. Yeah, I mean, this is what is said, and I'm just re relaying what has been said. <laughs> um, but I, I find it very interesting that that um, the rainbow energy, that light that they're talking about, that particular energy is always there. It just it just needs the right conditions for it to appear. The hose, you know, in in this particular sh shaft of sunlight, there's that there's that energy that is always there. It's always there. It's surrounding us. Um, and it, I find it very interesting that that's what they use when, when they're asking us to imagine what these beings are. It, so and what that does is it, it loosens up the idea that they exist inherently or solidly or that we can actually grasp onto them and you know, uh, be, be attached to them the way the ego, what we have generated here is something that was, seems very, very solid. And we can wrap our, around, our arms around it and we can connect with it in various ways that we connect with other bodies. And it all seems so solid. And the ego, this, this is where the ego finds it to be so believable. We believe that this is, is the nature of things. Solid, that's real. And yet that, that energy, that very, very subtle matter is always there underlying it. Science knows this, you know, they know this. You get down to the subatomic particles and you're basically down to energy. Yeah, and all of this is made of energy, that's but it's no way it appears to us. That's the path we're going, that we mm -hmm. know it's, it's there, like COVID has solid. Yeah, right. right. So that's a good ground for us to walk and say, it yeah. is there. It's there. Your natural conscious state is bliss. Yeah. Why are we not bliss? And that's <laughs> and so what's the reason? Whole, and then yeah. we go back to the four noble All truths. This discussion and teaching will probably lead you, you know, I don't, like I told you before, yeah. it might take out multiple lifetimes, who knows? But we all know that there is a bliss state that she saw the rainbow, mm -hmm. which is our natural conscious state. Right, right. So uh, where are we? We're close. Yeah, we're close. Um so we probably won't go too much further, but I, what I will do, um, so the question you raised and what we've been talking about today actually was right on target in terms of where we're at in this Precious Garland text, because it the question was perfectly positioned within the context of Nargajuna's next stanza. Um, 
So it, and it, it addre it, it's addressing the underlying meaning that is in the next stanza. So this is stanza 25. And Arjuna says, the doctrines of definite goodness are said by the conquerors to be deep, subtle, and frightening to the childish who are not learned. So, the, of course, the childish are, are those of us who are and have been completely absorbed in ego self-grasping ignorance. That's what they're using, you know, as, as childish there. And so these, these very deep and subtle and profound um, teachings that the Buddha gave to somebody who is really uh, wrapped up like Gollum in the ego self-grasping, these teachings are actually frightening. They are actually threatening. They may not put it that way. But at a, at a very deep level, they'll go, this isn't for me. You know, I'm not going to get out of this what I want. And this is why, you know, you don't see, except in some cultures, some cultures where, um, where Buddhism is their, their um, cultural religion, then you will see huge amounts of people. But um, even, even the Tibetans, when they go to listen to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, many of them are just there for the blessing. You know the blessing of just being in his presence, and so there is a there is a projection of kind of inherent existence onto his holiness, and a terrible fear, and a sense of bereft loss. Is what's going to happen when he dies, Chris? Yeah, I I was just going to share. I mean, I I have a and this and this is in in no way a claim that I was close to any real realization but um i had a very personal experience of that in meditation where and i would say and this was probably 12 12 years ago now and i would say it was when my meditation was the most consistent and regular and at its deepest point i, I don't think i've quite gotten back to that but um i hit a wall basically and, and I began having um, a kind of panic um, that would that set in. And and I asked um, and it was a fear of death. It was I, I would even even when I go to sleep at night, I would be almost kind of in a meditative state and I would I would bolt upright, f afraid mm -hmm. and, that I was dying. And I got an opportunity to ask a Geshe about it and said, hey, look, this is what's happening. I'm I, I said, I'm. I'm terrified. I feel like I'm going to die. And he just laughed. <laughs> you know, his response was to just kind of laugh. And and then he said, just just keep meditating. And and it took me a long, you know, at first I was like, wait, like I need an answer. I need help. I'm like, and then <laughs> I started to realize, oh, this is what I got to go through. <laughs> like I got to get to the other side of that. Yeah. And I couldn't at the time. I I just was not ready. I, I could not do it, and right. I had to take a break. <laughs> but I don't know if that is what I think it is. But but I think on some level, I my ego was lessening a, a bit, and it was scary. It it, it was sure. genuinely frightening. <laughs> um, I remember that actually. I remember you yeah, talking about in that. there when I asked the question. The, the, your ego was getting a little more than it had asked for, really. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and if you want to know how strong and unconsciously we cling to that, uh, another Geshe told me, you know, go stand on the edge of a building. You know, yeah. you will be you, something in you goes, huh? you know, and right. he's like, what is that? What's what's grabbing you? It's that self-preservation like that. And it's not I'm not saying it's a smart idea to go. Don't don't go stand on the side of a building. But you, it's an illustration because um, we've all felt that, you know, yeah, that fear. Um, and and that's that's how deep it is. <laughs> I think. Absolutely. You know, the interesting thing is, like it or not, we all are going to die. We know that. Right. We know that we see it happening all the time with people we love, our parents, our friends. We know it's going to happen to us ready or not so what buddhism is saying is do your best to be ready don't wait until you know the moment occurs like i'm dying you know 
have a plan, you know, yeah. have a plan. You know, how, what frame of mind do you want to be in and work towards that frame of mind? That's what the, the you know, because there is no way we're not going to die. I mean, it's clearly obvious. And, you know, the older we get, the closer we, we're getting to that point, right? Um, so, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, that's very good what you just mentioned because it's it's true. Um, well, and, and and one of those one of those same geshes, that's how he would often start classes. Is he would say, "Why are we here? Like, why why did y'all come?" And people would you he'd get these responses like, "Well, I want to calm my mind. I wanted to," and and then finally one of the students would say, "Because we're going to die," and he says, "That that's why you're here, mm -hmm. and that should be why you're here." <laughs> um and and we're we're preparing for that right we have to make the best use of this the particular life we have and the experience we have and well, how fortunate are we it's like it's been given to us um <clears throat> we only had to look just a little and and you know my goodness monks coming from the other part of the world and spending time with us is incredible um, and so we should recognize the value of that and not waste it, you know, really take the opportunity we have in whatever time we have left to, to work on that, you know? You know, personally, I consider it to be the most important thing, the most important thing to be doing. And it's not anything else but, but that, you know. Of course, you have to support yourself and be able to support your family, but, and that matters a lot. But after that... <laughs> You know, or equal with that is is the the um, this particular pathway that the Buddha taught because it is it will lead to our to the lessening and ultimately to the complete annihilation of suffering. If you want to put it that way, we will no longer have that, and we will only be wanting to be of benefit. And so, yeah, you can come back into cycle of existence, but not be affected by the, the suffering or the fear of it, which sounds like maybe that's possible to me. Maybe that's possible. <laughs> if I keep, you know, if I keep going on this, on this path and keep doing the practices, you know, uh, it's maybe it's possible to have an experience like uh, Brian had. I've had similar things where it, I panicked so much. I felt like I was going to die. And this is when I was younger and, um, and maybe I could not panic this time, you know, maybe the more, maybe the more we do this, the less panicky we'll get. But that's the thing. That's the thing that answers your question. It's the panic that's arising in the ego when it's confronted with this information, saying that thinking that it's meaning I'm not going to, the I, the thing that my precious thing I'm holding on to is going to be destroyed. And this is not what I want. So, you know. I don't I appreciate your taking so much effort to answer my question. But it was a good, good question. And then we had a lot of discussion. I appreciate your effort in, in thinking about this and answering. What's amazing to me is how perfectly your question fit with the very next stanza. You know, I thought, whoa. Sometimes, sometimes you get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> What's luck, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay, yes, so that's time. So we'll leave it there. You really didn't get into the uh yeah, that's fine though. Um okay. Are you gonna post those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh yeah, we'll do yeah. Let's do all of the let's do the dedication prayers that start with um may the precious body mind. Again, let's do it in English so we are know what we're saying. Um, may the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. So the Bodhi mind is is this mind of uh, enlightenment. What they call about Bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment that wants to uh, become enlightened, recognizing that we are all interconnected and interdependent and wanting to be a benefit to the whole system. That's what that is saying. May that keep increasing that, that mind. Then the next one. 
May the view of emptiness not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. So we want to keep up our studies, our discussions, our the slow revealing of understanding of what emptiness is talking about so that it increases and doesn't decline. And then the final dedication, in all my lives, may I not be separated from true lives and so enjoy the splendor of Dharma, fully perfecting the virtues and levels and paths. May I speedily attain the state of Vajradhara. And you know, this is an important line when it says true lamas, because um, all of the teachers say, you know, you really check these lamas out because there can be lamas that are not true lamas. And so it's up to us to just not think anybody who presents themselves as a, a lama or um, a spiritual teacher is necessarily going to be exactly what they're say, saying they are. There, there are there actually are charlatans out there, and there always have been. And so we have to be very, very uh, discerning. And I, we have been. We have been. All of the teachers we have are wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So I don't think we have words here. <laughs> but I just, that's an important, that's an important uh, line. True lungs. Okay. We're done. Thank you. <laughs> this is fun. Nice discussion. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna end our Lord of the Rings watch party now. Yeah, Lord of the Rings watch party. <laughs> my precious is my ego, right? My ego self grasping, and then the whole thing makes a yeah, bunch of sense. Huh. Yeah, we... someday we may get into that. I really want to get back to the Wizard of Oz too, because it's a very, yeah, very, very similar. Summer movie. Summer movie. Summer. Okay, yes. what am I doing? Uh, stop recording. Right? Wizard of Oz.